Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Denver Project for Humanistic Inquiry and Metropolitan State University of Denver's Pandemics Across the Ages, Coronavirus in Historical Context. We're going to move pretty quickly today, so please stay tuned to each of our speakers. First up to introduce everyone today is Dr. Denine Davidson, who is the president of Metro State University of Denver. Dr. Davidson. Hi, everybody. Uh, just wanted to say thank you for coming and whether you're part of MSU Denver community or not, we are so pleased to have you tuning in to listen to this conversation today. First, let me start off by saying uh, we are in Denver's, one of Denver's best kept secrets and that is Metropolitan State University of Denver. We are actually a thriving urban university in, with a world-class faculty and students. And you'll have all of our uh, faculty members and alumni on the front lines of um, healthcare industries battling COVID-19. We're in the laboratories manufacturing medical equipment that will save lives. And we're in the classrooms working with K-12 students. And we are here with you now to talk about one of the greatest health crises of our time. The Denver Project for Humanistic Inquiry, or DeFi as it's widely known, is MSU Denver's lively and dynamic public humanities center. And we aim to enrich Denver's cultural life through humanities-based programs that actually reframe our perspectives, challenge our assumptions, and stimulate dialogue like we will do today. We work in partnership with some of the most prominent cultural institutions in Denver, such as the Denver Center for Performing Arts and the Denver Art Museum. DeFi organizes roundtable discussions and art exhibits, film screenings, talkbacks and lectures that explore all sorts of timely issues and um, questions of abiding human concern. So our events showcase the talent and the expertise of our own MSU Denver faculty and we frequently bring in some of the most influential and sometimes controversial speakers. Martha Nussbaum's been here, Cornell West, Noam Chomsky. So please go ahead and check out the defi.org website to learn more about what we'll be doing in the future. Um, as you'll hear today from one of our panelists, there's a clear link between human health, professional health care, and the humanities. Healthcare providers become more effective when they have humanities-based contexts for understanding why populations suffer distinct illnesses or suffer differently than other groups of people. And without historical context, you know, how could we begin to understand the effects like the, these diseases, um, COVID-19, HIV, the plague? It's not just what happens with the infected individuals, but it's actually what happens in our societies and our cultures. We talk about the economic pieces a lot in this country, but what about what's happening across our communities as well? Many of us are wondering also, you know, when did this pandemic end? How do pandemics end? How do we know when they're over even? How do we know when it's safe to go back outside? Um, even if the virus ends, will people feel safe? How do, we, how do we get our hands around that? How do we get our heads around that? There was an article posted over the weekend talking about these things, and all the experts agreed that there's these clear social, political, and economic life that actually goes alongside every pandemic. It's like its own disease pathology. And so, you know, what happens in a city like Denver or wherever you may be watching us from when your community comes to a grinding halt for two months, actually, or more, we, we can look to the past and we can ask, has this happened before? And if so, what lessons can we learn? And so finally, I think we, we need to understand, this is why we do what we do, that we study humanities for their own sake. History, literature, philosophy really, really help us make sense of our world while also enabling us to live a more fulfilling life. So we really must actively counter that growing notion that university education is only a means to a better economic future. It's not just a jobs mill. Sure, I think there is definitely a link between understanding your world around you and your economic pursuits. I actually don't believe those two things are completely mutually exclusive, but to focus solely on the economic is to miss the opportunity to enter that rich and inspiring heritage of university learning that has brought human beings to the moon, but it also has made sure that those of us who stay on the earth do so with compassion and understanding and a much richer life. So I would say long live the humanities and especially at MSU Denver. So with that, I thank you again for joining us today. And I'd like to hand things over to our moderator, Dr. Kimberly Clement. 
Over Thank to you, you so much, Dr. Davidson. I'm always proud to be an MSU Denver Roadrunner and never more so than I have been in the last couple of months. So thank you for your introduction. And again, I want to do a really quick introduction of our panelists. I'll introduce everyone at the beginning so that you can have the order of everyone's talk today. And then in between, I will continue to introduce them as they come up. Please, if you have questions, take a look at our uh, information that's scrolling across the bottom of your screen and let us know those questions. This is about having a conversation. Each of the panelists gets merely five minutes to present their talk. So this is going to be history in the quick. Our first panelist today is Dr. Stephen Leonard of the History Department. His talk is the 1918-1919 flu pandemic in Denver and Colorado. He's the author of many books on Colorado, including the 1918 influenza epidemic in Colorado and essays and monographs in Colorado history. Our second speaker today is Adriana Nieto from the Chicano Chicana Studies Department. Her discussion today is pandemic and its impact across U.S.-Mexico borderlands, a family history. Dr. Nieto is the chair and of the Department of Chicano Chicana Studies, and her work focuses on Latino spiritualities and practices and the disproportionate impacts of pandemics and other disasters on the Latino, Latina, Latinx communities. Our third speaker today is Dr. Matthew Makeley of the History Department. His talk is The Speckled Monster in North America, Smallpox and Demographic Disaster Among Native Populations. Dr. Makeley's research centers on American history, particularly Native American history, particularly in the West. And his most recent publication is the 2018 book, 2018 book, The Small Shall Be Strong, A History of the Lake Tahoe Washoe Indians. And finally, our last two speakers, Brian Weiser of the History Department. He will be speaking on science, religion, and social distancing in 17th century in Europe. He's presented many times on social and medical consequences of the plague, and his most recent work focuses on shame and shaming in early modern England. And our final speaker today is Catherine Miller of the Gender, Women, and Sexualities Studies Department. Her work is on the HIV epidemic in India, a gendered examination. Ms. Miller has a master's degree in international disaster psychology, and her research is focused on gender-based violence and disaster mental health. She has also worked with women in Namakal, India, living with HIV in 2015. So our first speaker today is Dr. Stephen Leonard. We're going to be starting in Colorado and then moving out to a worldwide focus. So starting at home for us and looking at things in a larger, broader view. So today, I'd like to first welcome Dr. Stephen Leonard. Thank you, Kim. Dr. Davidson just asked a very good question, and that is, has this happened before? And the answer, of course, is yes, although not in exactly the same way. And so the lessons that we may derive from the 1918, 19, 19 pandemic are applicable, but not necessarily uh, totally applicable. Uh, the 1918-1919 pandemic took an estimated 14 to maybe 50 million people uh, worldwide, killed 675,000 people in the United States, and that was out of a population of 100 million. In Colorado, around 8,000 out of a population of a million and in Denver, around 1,500 out of a population of 250,000. Uh, those are horrendous numbers, especially when we consider that much of that happened in a four-month period between September of 1918 and early January of 1919. And of course, we'd have to multiply by a large factor for the increase in world population. So this was one of the major disasters, uh, certainly of modern times. No one really knows where it started. Uh, we do know that in the spring of 1918, there was a serious outbreak of what was called the grip uh, that uh, killed people uh, in places like Kansas and other places in the United States. Denver's mayor, uh, Robert Speer, died of the grip in May of 1918. Um, however, that was not a, a terribly deadly disease compared to the uh, second wave, which occurred in the fall of 1918. Seemingly, the grip mutated, uh, perhaps in Europe, probably in Europe, 
uh, returned to the United States by early September, maybe even late August of 1918, hit military camps and eastern cities first, but very rapidly spread across the country. Soldier trainees in Boulder were uh, affected as early as late September of 1918. Denver's first death occurred in uh, on September the 28th, 1918. A uh, 21-year-old student who uh, lived a few blocks from now in. Um, health authorities didn't really know what to do. Uh, their scientific understanding of the flu was uh, minimal to to none almost. Uh, they advised uh, having uh, clean clothes, a clean mouth, and a clean heart. There were plenty of quacks around who came up with all sorts of nostrums. They really had no no cure. They didn't even have an explanation. Um, all they could do was recognize that it was a tremendously uh, contagious, deadly respiratory disease. So they tried various things, quarantines, closings, um, telling people not to assemble in large numbers. Uh, and that went on throughout the state in October, November of uh, 1918. In most cases, those uh, prohibitions uh, didn't work or worked only minimally, and they were very loose prohibitions. For example, they at one point forbade out, uh, indoor meetings, but allowed outdoor meetings, and tens of thousands of people would congregate outdoors to buy war bonds or to march in parades or to do a variety of things. So uh, it was a very ineffective uh, uh, way of dealing with the uh, what they were facing. Um, in effect, by early December of 1918, they they virtually gave up and uh, just let uh, what was called the second wave uh, run its course. Uh, by early 1919, it was tapering off and uh, had largely gone away by June of 1919, although uh, there's some evidence that there was sporadic uh, reoccurrences in later in 1919 and even into uh, 1920. Two places in Colorado that I'd like to highlight outside of Denver was one that suffered greatly. That was Silverton, which had a population of around 2,000 and lost 146 people uh, of that small population. The other is Gunnison, which has gotten international attention in the last few months because it seemingly suffered no deaths in the uh, uh, first wave or in the second wave, rather, the uh, September to December wave. Um, that's probably because they were extremely lucky and because they imposed an in incredible quarantine and they're a very isolated town. And uh, they, for example, blockaded roads, wouldn't let anybody come in by train. If you got off the train in Gunnison, you went uh, into quarantine immediately. And so no one got off the train. So they seemingly evaded the uh, first wave of the flu. The unfortunate thing is, is that they opened again in January and they did were hit but not very hard by the third wave of the flu, losing probably three people in uh, uh, spring of 1919. Uh, Dr. Duane uh, uh, has done a, a tremendous research on this uh, from uh, the Western state, uh, D Duane Vandenbush, and uh, uh, written a good article on, on the subject of Gunnison. So it passed. We largely forgot it. We didn't take the public health lessons from it that we should have taken. Uh, its economic con consequences are unclear, really, because there's so much else was going on, including the uh, last uh, months of the First World War and then the uh, Reconstruction period after the First World War. So the 1918-1919 flu largely faded from memory. Uh, we have maybe one great boon from it, if you want a silver lining, and that was that Alexander Fleming in 1927, when he was doing research on the origins and the possible cures for the flu, um, quite by accident stumbled upon a mold which inhibited uh, bacteria growth, uh, and that turned out to be penicillin. So maybe, in a sense, what was discovered later uh, as a result of the flu, uh, wound up paying us back for the huge numbers of deaths that it caused initially. Uh, I believe uh, we're going to see from uh, Adriana Nieto next about
some of the more human consequences of the flu because I've given you a, uh, you know, a 30,000 foot view and uh, that's only a piece of history when you then begin to think about the people who really suffered in New Mexico and all over, it becomes much more real. Thank you so much, Dr. Leonard. We really appreciate that discussion. Uh, up next is Adriana Nieto and her pandemic and its impacts across U.S.-Mexico borderlands, a family history. Dr. Nieto. Hi, thank you. How's my volume? Good. Can you hear me? Okay. My son decided to start uh, practicing the trombone, so I had to put the headphones in. <laughs> Um, so thanks for uh, DeFi for hosting this and and all of the logistical support. I don't I don't think we could have done this without that. Um, I I came to this. I, I'm not an expert in the the flu epidemic of 1918, but I have been doing um, some autoethnographic research on my great grandmother who spent uh, the year from about uh, March 18th, 1918, for about a year later. We don't have an exact date for when she was released. Um, but she spent about a year in the New Mexico, what was called the New Mexico Insane Asylum. And that moment has been something that I've been spending time looking at um, to try to understand what that daily experience was like for her. And until I was able to go to the uh, state archives in Santa Fe and actually go to the New Mexico, um, what is now called the New Mexico Behavioral Institute, where they had some primary primary documents that they've saved there, I didn't really, I wasn't really thinking about the flu. I, it wasn't something that was like a point of um, inquiry for me. But when I was looking at, um, putting the pieces together, trying to figure out how she came to get sent to the New Mexico Insane Asylum. I had to look at the broader context in which her life was um, taking place at the time. So she was living in um, outside of Alamogordo, New Mexico. Her mother um, was from northern Mexico in Jerez, Zacatecas, and she had migrated to along with about a million Mexicans across into the U.S. from Mexico between 1900 and 1930. We see about a million Mexicans migrating to the U.S., both because of the political violence of the Mexican Revolution in Mexico, but also um, to fill a huge um, sort of void in labor for uh, in mining, agriculture, and railroad throughout the Southwest. So, she, so her mother was part of that wave of migration. She was her mother was also a midwife in Alamogordo, and her father was born right there um, outside of uh, La Luz, New Mexico. He was Mescalero Apache. So, this is the context in which she's living. Her dad, her husband, her brothers were all working at a brick factory in Ancho, New Mexico. In fact, many of them you might have bricks that have the Ancho stamp on at your house, because a lot of those bricks ended up coming to Denver. Um, so she is, her mother passes away in about 1916. We don't have an exact date, but there's this famous photo that um, my grandmother had kept. And um, she showed my cousin and I uh, this photo one time, many years ago, before I was trying to be a historian or anything like that. And uh, she said, see this picture? Everyone in this picture died except for this one, this one, this one, this one. And one of them was her. She was like four years old in the, in the photo. And her mother, Maria. So Maria is the one who gets sent to the New Mexico Insane Asylum um, based on oral interviews that were um, recorded, luckily, with my grandmother. Uh, she was, it was a postpartum episode, postpartum break. My grandma said, she got sick from her mind. And then she says, I think it was, I think they call it postpartum now. So part of, part of what I've been trying to figure out is um, as a, as a historian who, who tries to look at the experiences of Chicanas, right? We are not in the archives. We're not there. And so part of my challenge has just been to locate her name. I was able to find her name at the institution, but I haven't been able to find the county level order that sent her to the insane asylum at the time. So I don't know who sent her. I don't know who signed the papers. We haven't been able to find a county record of that. 
But as far as we understand, she was having a severe post postpartum episode, and it's in the context of this flu that took her husband and her baby that she had just had. So she goes to the insane asylum, and then while I'm looking at the for records of her there, I came across this scandal um, that was largely due to the um, flu spreading through this institution that had been chronically underfunded by the territorial and then the state government. They were, um, I found, you know, testimonies from some of the workers who were concerned about the hygiene at the institution. Um, there were bodies who had, you know, folks who had died of the flu who weren't being buried properly. They didn't have the right um, incinerator, incin incinerator to take care of the linens. So I've just been reflecting a little bit on how, you know, what, what, the, what some of the stats we're seeing right now about the disproportionate impact, especially in terms of the death rates on communities of color. Um, and, and I, and I'm sad that we're seeing some rep, some things repeating right over these hundred years that we're not seeing adequate protection for people who are working, for example, in institutions where people are living very close together, where we're seeing people suffer from um, conditions that are very much due to uh, the sort of um, force of force into wage labor as opposed to people being able to work from where they where they were from people being displaced from their land people being being forced to migrate because of the political um, violence in Mexico and then when they're arriving here the the lack of infrastructure right there's no health care there's no there's no um, access to the resources that someone who's who's um, susceptible to postpartum depression, there's, there's no resources for that. Um, so it's just, so I'm coming at this through a very sort of personal, um, personal reflection, but also really, really thinking about how do we, how do we apply it, right? How do we under, how do we understand both of those experiences and what we're going through now? And what can we do? What can we learn from it? What can we teach our communities and our students about from it? Thank you so much, Dr. Nieto. I've been looking forward to hearing this talk for the last couple of weeks, and I'm really excited to have gotten part to hear part of that. Up next is Matt Makeley, and his talk is The Speckled Monster in North America, Smallpox and Demographic Disaster Amongst Native American Populations. Dr. Makeley. Thank you, Dr. Klimek, and, and thank you, uh, Dr. Nieto and Dr. Davidson. I think my talk will uh, dovetail nicely to the comments you both offered with respect to diseases being more than just uh, the pathology of a virus or a bacteria, uh, and, and in fact involves much, much more. I, I hope that's evident from um, this short paper I will now read. In 1838, the former fur trader, now Indian agent, Joshua Pilcher, wrote to report on the native communities of the Upper Missouri River region, quote, during the last year, one of these tribes, the Mandans, have been so diminished by smallpox, they will cease to exist as a nation, end quote. Fortunately, Pilcher was wrong. The Mandan survived. The smallpox outbreak he wrote of, it wasn't the first to erupt on the Missouri. An earlier devastating wave struck in the 1780s. That one had left the Mandan reeling they were forced to break up and abandon villages. In their own words, quote, a great many Mandan had died and they were no longer strong and fearless, end quote. Historian James Brooks recounted a Mandan story of Black Wolf who endured four great trials. The fourth and most imposing came in the form of a monster that crawled from the sea. In the words of Brooks, the monster was, quote, covered in bloody sores and oozing pustules, end quote. It's likely that that brutal monster represented the arrival of smallpox in the Mandan world and mythology. Black Wolf Woman defeated the monster and the Mandan survived. Perhaps no disease has taken a greater toll on humans than smallpox. It was often referred to as the speckled monster and it has left no region or people untouched. There's possible evidence of the disease in mummified Egyptian remains from the third century BCE. The first definitive written account appeared in China in the 4th century CE, 
Although many scholars believe the Antonine Plague 165 to 180 CE was caused by smallpox, some have even suggested that plague set in motion the long steady decline that culminated in Rome's collapse. But the first outbreak in the Americas occurred in 1519 among the Taino people on the island of Hispaniola, today Haiti and the Dominican Republic. The late scholar Alfred Crosby, author of The Columbian Exchange, labeled smallpox the most fatal of all diseases to impact native populations. It's likely that smallpox could drop native populations by 50% or even more. In his words, quote, it ravaged the Plains tribes, killing two thirds of the Omahas and perhaps half the population between the Missouri River and New Mexico, end quote. Crosby's work went on to describe a phenomenon he labeled as virgin soil epidemics. The idea is that because native people did not have exposure to diseases like smallpox, the lethality was far greater. This became a very useful explanation for understanding the massive population decline among native people in the Americas due to disease. However, the recent work of Harvard professor David Jones and many others reminds us that Crosby himself was careful to point out that immunological inferiority was not the sole cause for the massive loss of life. In other words, there's more to disease than simply a viral pathology. We must try to understand the full context of a people, their society, and their culture as we grapple with the impact of diseases like smallpox. Would smallpox have been so lethal for native people had they not been under the constant stress of Euro-American colonization? Professor Jones puts it this way, quote, it was the turbulence of colonization and not genetic liability that created Indians devastating susceptibility to imported pathogens, end quote. So here we can make a link to COVID-19 and what we're presently going through. Why are certain populations suffering greater rates of infection, morbidity, and mortality? I'm afraid like Dr. Leonard indicated and Dr. Nieto, it's because we haven't learned from our history. Perhaps we didn't study it enough. Perhaps we weren't given the opportunity to study it. Because we know that socioeconomic and cultural factors absolutely contribute to the spread of disease. Prolonged exposure to poverty, discrimination, lack of health care, lack of access to fresh seasonal foods, and a host of other variables create more opportunity for diseases like COVID-19 to ravage particular populations. While we've made remarkable advances in science and medicine, we cannot forget that diseases are more than viruses and bacteria. I conclude with the words from Harvard-trained physician, Dr. Rita Sharon. In her speech to accept the Jefferson Award in 2018, she stated, quote, beyond the bleeding and the seizing, we need to see the complex lived experience of the person facing a health problem. If we don't, we miss the very reasons that person visits us, their symptoms, their fears, their awareness of fragility. I am convinced with evidence to support my conviction that study and practice in the humanities is the most direct means to enable doctors to see the suffering that surrounds them." End quote. My short paper here today suggests that all of us, not just doctors, engage in the humanities to better understand not only the suffering we find around us, but the resiliency of human communities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Makeley. That was really fascinating uh, and well done in that time period too. You were right on the money. Our next talk is Dr. Brian Weiser. His is Science, Religion, and Social Distancing in 17th Century Europe. Dr. Weiser. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I wasn't planning on talking about poverty and the Black Death, but the Black Death, like many of the, these other diseases, the poor suffered much more. Uh, much more worse than anyone else. So in 1894, Alexandra Yersin discovered the bacillus responsible for the bubonic plague, gaining the dubious distinction of having the deadly bacteria named after him. Yersinia pestis infects black rats. When the rats die, the fleas living on the rats find other hosts, including humans. Once bitten, victims suffered vomiting, buboes that appear in the lymphatic glands, carbuncles which come anywhere, the blains, which are things like blisters, and the tokens, which are spots of bright flaming red color. Between 60 and 80% of the infected died. When it hit Europe in 1348, one third to one half of all Europeans died. It plagued Europe for the next 400 years. In Genoa in 1656, 50,000 of the 75,000 inhabitants died. <clears throat> no one in the 1600s knew about bacteria, nor connected flea bites to plague victims. 
Some few noticed an abundance of dead rats during the plague. Most interpreted, that, interpreted them as an omen. Only one French doctor saw rats as a vector of disease. To explain the disease and how it spread, some people turned to religion, arguing that the plague came from divine providence and all humans could do was to sin less and pray more. Thinkers inclined to the religious interpretation argued that the plague's unpredictability spoke to its divine origin. Others using contemporary medical theory claimed that the plague was brought about by miasmas, ill-smelling vapors, and contagion, a seminary tincture of a venomous quality spread through touching and breathing. Combining these theories with lessons from experience, health officials proposed some salubrious measures, even if they were based on incorrect theory. For instance, they ordered the streets clean to prevent miasmas, and such actions were beneficial because they reduced the number of rats and fleas. Similarly, the plague doctor's robe, covered with a paste made of wax and aromatic substances, was designed so that miasmas, which were thought to stick to coarse surfaces, would slide by the slick wax. But as one Genoese plague doctor put it, the waxed robe in a pest house is good only to protect one from the fleas, which cannot nest in it. To stop contagion, health officials turn to social distancing. Unaware of fleas' roles in transference and unaware that different diseases spread by different methods, doctors assumed that human-to-human -human transference was common and therefore thought social distancing an effective preventative measure. Italian authorities denied entry to ships from infected ports, erected pest houses to isolate the sick, and discouraged large gatherings. English towns prohibited individuals from plague-stricken areas, ordered those who came in contact with plague victims to carry white wands so that everyone could steer clear of them, and most terrifyingly, ordered plague victims and every member of their household confined to their houses. Their doors and windows would be nailed shut. A red cross and the words, may God have mercy on their souls, would be painted on their doors. In England, partly because the church was subservient to the state, the religious and medical theories behind the plague rarely came into conflict. When plague hit, the medically inclined wanted the theaters shut down because so many people congregated there. The providentially inclined wanted the theaters shut down because they were dens of iniquity. In Roman Catholic Italy, however, the providentially inclined and the medically inclined often came to loggerheads over religious processions. For some priests and priors, processions were seen as uniting the community, urging repentance and beseeching God. But for health officials, processions meant contagion. In Monte Lupo, a small village about 20 miles from Florence, these two views came into conflict. Monte Lupo had been a place of contention for some time. Two successive plague commissioners had a great deal of difficulty getting the inhabitants to accept the rules of quarantine. At the entrance of the city, they had to build a stockade to prevent travel in and out. Then in July of 1631, the parish priest, to stop the raging plague, decided to hold a procession led by a particularly horrific car crucifix, which depicted Jesus covered in blood and contorted in agony. The priest invited villagers from the entire area, thereby breaking quarantine. The commission for health sent a surgeon named Coveri to deal with the situation. By the time Coveri arrived, it was too late to fully stop the procession, but he sent guards to each house, saying that only adult men should participate because at the time they thought women and children were much more susceptible to disease. Coveri's order was ignored. Coveri then sent a corporal with three guards to stop women and children crowding into the church during Vespers. The priest and the local baker confronted the guards and the baker said, what do you want here? If you don't leave, I shall make you go with musket shots. And this was no idle threat. There were two racks of muskets at the entrance of the church because whenever the crucifix left the church, it was always welcomed back with a salute of musket fire. The corporal was able to persuade the priest and the baker to hand over the guns, but was unable to end the wanton disregard for all forms of social separation. The Vesper service was packed, multiple processions occurred, and many people feasted in the church. The metaphorical dam had burst. That night, the street filled with carousing men, also a surgeon and apothecary who worked in the pest house and therefore should have been self-isolating, decided to go to a nearby village to serenade a young woman. They met up with another large, larger group who proceeded to go to the stockade, which had been closed at nightfall. But a plank was missing from the stockade, and the party slipped out. The literal dam soon burst as well. A few hours later, a group of four people dismantled the stockade, a clear attack on the authority of the health magistrates and the Duchy of Florence. Despite our increased scientific knowledge, the tensions of Monte Lupo still exist today. Economic, social, cultural, and religious forces all play roles in our pandemic response. The question that plagued me as I reread the story of Monte Lupo was, will removing one plank result in the dismantling of the entire barricade? Thank you.
That was a great last line, Dr. Weiser. Thank you for that. <laughs> I really appreciated that. All right, our final speaker today is Kat Miller, Catherine Miller. And Ms. Miller is going to be talking to us today about the HIV pandemic in India, a gendered examination. Ms. Miller. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to pull up the anchor today. Um, you know, similar to Adriana, um, I'm not a historian um, by trade, and, uh, you know, I don't have extensive research, you know, when it comes to HIV. However, um, I did spend um, a couple of months working in uh, Namakal in Tamil Nadu, um, India, in 2015 um, at the uh, Concern for AIDS Research and Education Center, uh, working with women um, and children who are living with HIV. And so a large part of what I want to talk about are, you know, things that I saw um, and heard from the women there um, while while I was essentially, you know, living there. Um, and some of them, you know, very closely mirror things that that you've heard from past presenters, which really does make me agree with, you know, Matt's sentiment is that maybe we haven't studied history enough and maybe we haven't learned enough. Um, and maybe this is our opportunity that COVID is our opportunity to, to learn better and do better when we know better. Um, but I'm sure that you know um, HIV stands for the human immunodeficiency virus, um, is generally most commonly spread um, through um, unprotected sex um, and intravenous drug use um, less commonly, but that is a concern. Um, and sometimes also through breast milk and less commonly um, through childbirth. Um, there is no vaccine, like there is no cure um, for HIV. So it is something that we are certainly still um, living with, not just in India, but around the world. Um, and so that is, you know, maybe a little bit different than things that we've talked about historically. Um, but the first cases of HIV were found in India in 1986, which is, um, you know, just a few years after the, uh, it was discovered in the United States. Um, and wasn't really being researched or looked at in India at, at all, really, because uh, they just kind of assumed that there would be a vaccine before it actually hit their border. Um, because what they were watching, you know, with things unfolding in the United States is, you know, well, we're a little bit more traditionalist. Um, and, you know, so this isn't really going to impact us. It's not going to affect us. Um, and, it, and if it does, um, then there will be a vaccine and we'll be OK. Um, and so, like, maybe some of that mirrors some of the stuff that we're seeing today. Um, but it, they did find cases um, in 1986, um, first among um, six women who were sex workers uh, in Chennai, India, which is also, also in southern India. Um, and then after that discovery, it was very quickly found out that, in fact, it was kind of all over India. Um, and India um, is a very, very, very large um, country, um, has about 1.2, 1.3 billion people who live there right now. Um, and currently has the third largest HIV epidemic in the world. Um, and on average holds, um, like cases have been decreasing um, since, you know, 2001 um, with AZT drugs and all of those kinds of things, but holds pretty steady at 2.1 million people um, living right now in India with HIV. Um, and those who are most impacted generally um, are sex workers, um, most commonly who tend to be heterosexual women. Um, men who identify as having sex with men, um, and, uh, those who do, um, inject drugs. So like, those are the, the highest and most at risk populations, um, specifically if they live in more rural communities. So when I talk about Namakal, India, just kind of like paint a little bit of a picture, you know, like most of the people who live there do not have running water, um, do not have electricity, um, do not have like secure methods of transportation um, outside of their own villages. Um, so things like, you know, getting to a hospital or something like that would, you know, take a lot of time um, and resources, so it wasn't quite as common. Um, and women in particular um, who are living with HIV um, are highly stigmatized um, in their communities. Um, and this also plays into, you know, a lot of other things that my colleagues have mentioned um, in terms of like socioeconomic status, um, that certainly plays a role if you can't, you know, access um, the drugs that are needed, um, a lot lower literacy rates. Um, girls in Namakal are finishing school somewhere between 13 and 14 and then and then getting married. Um, so a, like a huge lack of education. Um, 
women who are darker skinned because of colorism also tend to, to be treated more poorly um, to the extent that, you know, I heard a story from one woman who uh, noted that when she went in to give um, birth to her son, um, when she told uh, the doctors and the nurses that she was HIV positive, um, they were so afraid of her that they wouldn't touch her anymore. Um, and they left her in the room by herself, even though she was screaming and she was scared and she thought that she was going to die. Um, and she gave birth to her child by herself. Um, and no one even came in to check on her. She just kind of ended up leaving. Um, and that, you know, was pretty hard and traumatizing and, and obviously something that she still um, remembered, even though her son um, at the time that I met her was almost 10 years old, which means he's about 15 now. Um, and so, like, that's the kind of treatment that people were looking at, like, even if they were, um, you know, seeking pretty traditional uh, resources and just trying to engage with community. Um, also heard a lot of stories um, from women who were uh, beaten in their villages. Um, if people found out that they were HIV positive, who were afraid to seek out care because they didn't want to tell people where they were going. Um, there's a big thing, like women generally shouldn't be leaving the home, um, in that part of the country. Um, so it's like, if you're going to go somewhere, where are you going? Who are you going with? Um, and a lot of like, I guess what, what we as Westerners would call nosiness, um, happening in those communities. Um, and so that's a lot, you know, of, of what I was seeing and, you know, kind of what makes me think about what we may see progressively, um, with the coronavirus, um, not just in the United States, but worldwide, um, Thank you, and I think we're ready to entertain questions. Thank you, Ms. Miller. That was really fascinating. I really liked the book ending that we had here about communities and discussions of very large scale pandemics, but also the very human things that deal with these pandemics. And I can tell you that uh, you never get over birth trauma. That's just something that sticks with you for life. <laughs> but I really like the fact that we had uh, you ending this because I think it worked really well with Dr. Leonard and Dr. Nieto's work. We've had many questions come in over the line. So um, I'd like to just kind of uh, maybe one per person if we get some other questions come in here, but I've had quite a few. Um, Dr. Makeley, I've had three questions for you, and the most prominent one seems to be if you could speak a little bit to the situation going on right now with the Oglala Sioux Tribe and the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, or maybe the Navajo experience with the disease in uh, New Mexico and Arizona. Yeah, thanks for that question. I, I appreciate it, and um, it's it's something I, I um, certainly am not an in, in expert in, but um, I, I can say that uh, what we're finding in uh, reservation communities is many of the same factors at play during the smallpox epidemic with respect to um, access to uh, fresh drinking water consistently, particularly on more rural parts of the reservation. I don't want to paint with too broad a uh, stroke here because there are certainly reservations towns that um, have um, all the amenities we would consider um, necessary in modern society necessary um, but but in some of the more rural pockets of reservations among some of the families that are perhaps um, more traditional and and less um, connected to um, the populations of their community that are circulating in, in the cities and and um, kind of uh, taking advantage of um, resources that may be available through um, clinics and, and health clinics. Um, the rates of infection um, will likely be be higher, but then again, the, there's still the potential that um, they're, they're isolated and, and not in directly in harm's way um, on a consistent basis. So I, I, I would imagine that the trajectory is, is going to be similar, hopefully, and, and I think it's, it's true that the mortality rate is is far less severe with um, COVID-19 than um, smallpox. Smallpox, the uh, mortality rate um, in some instances was over 50%. And while we don't have a clear denominator to fully determine what the rate of um, mortality is with COVID-19, um, it's going to be much less than 50%. So hopefully we don't see um, devastating loss of life in, in the reservations that um, reservation communities that uh, don't have access to a lot of um, the things you need to stay healthy and um, defend yourself against a virus like COVID-19.
Thank you very much, Dr. Makeley. And that kind of brings us to a question that I received for Dr. Dr. Nieto, uh, kind of talking as you did a little bit in your, your brief remarks about how communities of color are disproportionately affected because of um, just the treatment that they've received and the, the way that life uh, kind of treats them in many different ways. And I had a question here that talked a little bit about the mental health consequences of pandemics. And that and really kind of spoke to what you were talking about here. And the person was wondering if you could expand a little bit about this idea of mental health consequences of pandemics for communities of color, uh, for women, um, and in any other way that you'd like to, to address that. Okay. Um, I'll try. Yeah, that's not a, that's not a small. I'm just going to give you the biggest question. Although I got a really big question for Brian too. So okay, good. Um, well, I do. I think that there is a lot of. Um, I think uh, a lot of things that we see happening are have always been there, right? We've we've all we always we know that communities of color are have challenges in uh, physical health in terms of we have higher rates of diabetes, we have higher rates of heart disease, we have higher, um, we have less access to regular health care, um, you know, for a, due in large part to the kinds of um, jobs that we're, that we have, right, whether we have benefits, whether we're full time, whether part time, all those factors. Um, but I think as, as you know, speaking from the Latino, Latina community, mental health is something that we have, we have a hard time talking about in non-pandemic circumstances. Um, so I think it's a good, I mean, if there's anything positive, I guess it's that we, that we need, that we're, we're at a point where we can be talking about it publicly because we're not the only ones that are having you know, some challenges with our mental health under these circumstances. The whole world is. It's not just a Latino thing and some inferiority of our cultural upbringing or our, you know, our gene, our genes. Something you mentioned, Matt, and yours was references to some kind of, you know, inferior genetics in terms of being able to fight some of these diseases. Um, but I think it really points to the fact that we have to think about these things very holistically and that if we have we have struggles with mental health in good circumstances, like when my grandma talked about her mom going to the insane asylum, no one ever said, well, she went to the insane asylum. They all said, oh, yes, that was when she was in Las Vegas because everybody knew that Las Vegas, New Mexico, that's where the that's where it was. But no one said that. They just said, oh, yeah, she went to Las Vegas. And so I think if I think maybe something that can come out of this is is more openness. Um, and willingness to talk to talk about mental health challenges that are uh, that are underlying, and then when something like this happens, it just uncovers all the layers that um, that increase the complications and make it all that more all more important to really identify where those holes are and where do we get help in good times and in pandemic times. Oh man, I almost wish I'd asked you that question at the end because I think that's such an amazingly great answer and it makes me feel so kind of powerful and hopeful. Um, and I, I just really love that. So so thanks for that. I'm gonna depress us a little bit further. I've got two questions that kind of work off of those for Brian and for or for Dr. Weiser and for Ms. Miller. So, um, and they're gonna go together. So uh, Dr. Weiser, I'm gonna ask you yours first, but Ms. Miller, yours is coming right after it because it's gonna work right into that. So the question we had for you was, uh, I was under the impression that Jews were scapegoated for the Black Death in the 14th century. Can I, can I just take a super quick pause and say, as a medieval historian, we don't say the words Black Death anymore. Uh, we call it the bubonic plague or the great plague. There's a whole bunch of reasons behind that, but I'm just gonna, I'm going to go this just this little spot, but we just we say the great plague. OK, so with the plague, um, was this also the case in later pandemics? I've seen a bit of that in the current pandemic as well. So could you talk a little bit about the role um, and the scapegoating of uh, if if you want to about Jews in the 14th century? Does it happen in the later the 17th century at all? Brian, you're still muted. Yeah, I was coughing. Um, so yeah, in the 14th century, it happens all the time that you know uh, Jews are thought to of be uh, are blamed for the plague. Um, 
there may be a tiny, tiny bit of evidence that the Jews were less susceptible to plagues because they bathed slightly more. Um, and maybe that had something to do with it, but it was probably just people looking for an explanation. Um, and the general theory was, you know, the Jews poisoned the wells. Um, it wasn't, and the Jews, of course, suffered for that. I haven't seen that much scapegoating of the Jews in the 17th century. It may be that they had a better idea about how the disease worked. You know, granted, the idea was wrong. But there, in the 17th century, there was this, the idea of contagion and the idea of miasma. Um, so they weren't thinking about things like the Jews poisoning the wells. That said, um, there was always a great fear of foreigners when it came to the Black Death. I know that um, in England, and par partly one of the reasons my, my, you know, my field is in England, and there weren't really that many Jews in England. You know, in, in the Black Death in 1665, there were maybe 40 or 50. Um, so th uh, that may be one reason why I haven't heard so much about Jews being blamed because they didn't, they weren't there. Um, uh, but what I was saying before was that the there tended to be a sense that the Black Death came from elsewhere. So I said the bubonic plague, sorry, came from elsewhere. Um, and therefore, <laughs> um, old habits are hard to break. Uh, and since there was an idea that came from elsewhere, like the um, Dutch community in London were both stricken with the plague much more because where they lived, which was there were more rats there. And also they had more contact with the Dutch and generally the, the, the plague started in the Netherlands and then came to um, and then came to England. So they, they could be, be blamed. And there is a, often there was rules to, I know at one point in Italy, there were one of the, one of the rules was, okay, there's, um, the black plague is coming back to expel all the Jews. But I don't think they, they were seen as much as, um, intentionally spreading the plague, but more seen as vectors. Can I, can I add, yeah, I wanted to add just a little bit because I've actually gotten a couple questions um, since our promotional stuff went out about the use of the term Spanish flu for the 1918. And maybe um, Dr. Leonard can talk about it a little bit too. And, you know, I'm not an expert in, this, in, this, in the 1918 flu, but my understanding is that it's very similar to um, the use of, you know, scapegoating particular populations. And if you're trying to associate, especially we're talking 1918 in the, in the U.S. context, um, if there's an association with Spanish, they're not necessarily only talking about from Spain. They're talking about people who speak Spanish as much um, as anything else. So I think uh, that was a question that came to me um, from some folks from the Latino Faculty Staff Association through an email last night, just wanting, just, just, you know, wanting to know what I thought about the, the use of the term Spanish flu. And I, I think I might have used it in the interview that we did for the early bird. And I, I um, wanted to just bring that to light as, you know, as in the con contemporary context with the use of, of you know, the Chinese virus that some people have said in very large platforms. So I think there's some parallels to this, this need for us to scapegoat and try to act like it's, it's only, you know, reserved for certain people. It just points to the ignorance of, of the science and how, how disease works. Yeah, I, um, it, it got dubbed the Spanish flu because early reports of uh, it came from Spain. And that was because Spain wasn't uh, censoring their press. They were not uh, France and Germany and uh, were keeping quiet because they figured it was a kind of information they didn't want to give the enemy. While Spain was open about how they were suffering, and the king of Spain, I think he was Alfonso the Thirteenth, got got the flu. I think he probably survived, but nevertheless, when you have a high-profile uh, flu sufferer, it gets more attention than a low-profile flu sufferer. I don't think it was meant to be particularly scapegoating in, in the case of uh, Spain. Um, and frankly, I, I suspect that if, it, if there had been scapegoating in the United States uh, it, uh, against the Hispanic population, they would have called it the Mexican flu or something of that nature. So I, I, I think uh, that kind of scapegoating, that wasn't going on with the term Spanish flu. 
However, there was scapegoating. Uh, uh, the The big scapegoat was uh, it was Germany. In fact, they, they called it the German germ, and the uh, the assumption was being made that the Germans were using germ warfare, and uh, so that was a, a big piece of scapegoating. Uh, obviously false because the Germans suffered horrendously from from that, and frankly, the Germans uh, didn't have the technical means to uh, uh, to create the, the the flu virus at that that point. Uh, in Denver, uh, health officials blamed the Italians in North Denver for not taking proper health uh, uh, precautions. In Durango, they blamed the Southern Ute Indians for uh, their own uh, uh, diseases because they said they're not, and 40 Southern Utes, at least 40 died. Um, people in Durango said, the Durango newspaper said, uh, they're just not paying attention to what, uh, you know, the superintendent down there is telling them in terms of, uh, uh, of health. So, uh, yeah, they're scapegoating. I, I don't think it was specifically after the Spanish, however. Uh, it just was an accident of history that uh, it got that name. Thank you, Dr. Thank Leonard. You, uh, that brings us back to the question that I had for Ms. Miller. That's a, kind of a combo question that was asked by a couple of people on our uh, who'd called in. When the Great Plague hit India in 1619, 16, or 1619, 1620, it also uh, impacted people of the lower classes more heavily than the upper classes, as we've kind of seen through this. And at the same time, then there was also this colorism aspect. So one of the questions that came to us was, uh, could Ms. Miller please talk about racism and colorism with COVID-19 in India today? And if she has any insight into the U.S. as well. Uh, yeah. Wow. What a, what a loaded question. Um, I'm, I got really nervous. I, I don't know who's, um, out there, you guys, but they are asking some really amazing questions. So Truly. keep them coming. Truly. I got really nervous for a second that you were going to ask me to talk about the plague in the 1600s. And I was like, yeah, can't, can't do that. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of glad that it went in a different direction. Um, but I think, you know, like, We've definitely seen, um, I mean, racism and colorism are rampant in the United States, like regardless of COVID. So like that is like COVID is not the thing that's like making racism and colorism happen. Um, so if, you know, if that's a place where you were at before, I'm just going to dispel that right now. Um, that's not where we were at. Racism um, and colorism are alive and well. Um, but we are seeing, you know, some very specific um targeted forms of racism, um, particularly towards Asian folks right now, um, because, uh, you know, the coronavirus, you know, as far as we know, originated in China. Um, and so there's this assumption um, that anyone who is of Asian descent, whether they're from China or not, um, is somehow responsible um, or they're dirty or, you um, you know, like, well, if you touch me, then I'm going to get it kind of thing, which actually, you know, like kind of mirrors like what we saw with HIV, too, in, in the in the early years. And when I say we, I, I don't mean me. I, I was born in 1985. So like I was a child. I have no idea about any of that. But um, this idea of like how things spread and who's responsible for, for spreading it. And so I think that that does go along with that scapegoating really well. Um, and then I think, you know, like we are seeing, you know, very, very clear um, targeted racism um, towards Asian folks, but also, you know, as more um, news stations started to report um, that Black folks in particular were dying um, at a higher rate from COVID um, and that one of, you know, there are many reasons for that, but also talking about how communities of color, as Adriana noted, may have less access um, to insurance and healthcare in general. Um, I know that there was a lot of comment going around being like, that's not true. That's not true. Those things aren't true. Um, and so like, I think in like potentially to like further blame people of color um, for the reasons why they may die um, at higher rates um, from such diseases. And so I think like we're seeing it in so many different facets and I feel like it, it changes really rapidly um, right now, which is really, really it's disheartening to see racism and colorism all the time. Um, and it's somehow feels even more disheartening now. Um, and, you know, and that's me coming from a place of privilege. I'm a very, very white person, as I'm sure you all can tell. 
um, you know, German and, and Dutch. So like the whitest of the white. Um, and I have a lot of privilege being able to like to navigate the world um, with the way that I look in that way um, and having access to things that I have access to. So like I don't have to worry, you know, about going out into my community um, and like going to the grocery store and worried that like I'm going to be spit on or um, violently harassed in some way um, because like I started COVID or, you know, so I don't have to worry about those kinds of things. Um, and generally speaking, you know, if I went to a doctor and you know, said like, I have these symptoms. Um, I'm more likely to be believed because I'm white, but less likely to be believed because I'm a woman. So like, there are some dual things there. Um, but a lot less likely to have that be attributed to, you know, like, like other health concerns or other health causes um, that that may be um, impacting folks of color more than white folks. So I think that there are a lot of considerations. And I tried to wrap up a lot of things in that response. I hope that that answered that question. But if it if it didn't ask it again, and I'll try better. Excellent. No, I think you did get some really important points in there. Um, Dr. Nieto, I had a question for you because I was so fascinated uh, with your story and um, how this kind of blends together this idea of mothering and um, communities of color and birth and mental health. And I was wondering just a little bit too, if maybe you could talk about the importance of um, family histories and oral histories to the wider idea of history. Because as Dr. Leonard mentioned, sometimes it's a lot easier for us to look from 30,000 feet, but it's more important for us to look from six feet. So could you maybe discuss that just a little bit? Um, sure. I actually, I mean, I think that's a big part of um, what Chicano Chicana Studies does, whether we're grounded in the history department. I'm not, I was, all of my degrees are interdisciplinary, but most of my training was through, was with history faculty. And so the whole question about, you know, the, you know, the lessons history colleagues, right, about primary sources and secondary sources. And when I was first doing my master's, I was asked um, to, to find a set of archives that would um, help me help me talk about m Protestants and Mexicans in the Southwest. And it's, it was a Latin American studies program and Latin American studies at that time drew a very clear line at the border. If you're doing Latin American studies at south of the US-Mexico border, if you're doing um, anything north of the border, you're, you're doing Western history or you're doing, and Chicano history is still a very young, discipline. And, and part of the challenge with that is finding the, finding the archives, like, especially when, when I'm trying to look at the experiences of, of women in um, Mexican communities, because if there is a written record, it's going to be usually written by men and about men in the archives. And so the, the way the, the, I had to come up with my own primary sources, and that is, that is through these oral history interviews. So most of my own research practice as a historian is is oral history interviews. Um, and it's really, you know, <clears throat> my my research as a doctoral student was was specifically on Mexican American Protestant women. And throughout the now that I'm coming to this topic, right? Um, I had at least three interviews with women whose families came across the border in the Texas region. So like tech, uh, Laredo, Nuevo Laredo area, who uh, my memory was jogged that they mentioned that they, their families, most of them died from the flu. And that was part of what motivated them to come across the border as much as the Mexican revolution. So it might be something that I had that I could go back and look at closer too. but, but oral histories are the foundation for, of Chicana history because that's, that's where our resources are, is, is passed down. And so I, I often encourage my student, my intro classes, we always, I always have them do a family, some kind of an interview with an ancestor about their own migration story, no matter what their background is. Um, and, and they find it really valuable. Sometimes later they didn't, they didn't realize how important it was until after like the person they interviewed passed away and they're very thankful that they have some kind of record of um, their family stories. So um, it's also really important to ask women their stories because so often, like all the interviews that I've done, the women are like, I don't think this probably isn't really important, but, or you probably don't want to hear this because it's, you know, this is just my, you know, my woman's story. And, and it's often hard to, to talk about very, very 
emotional traumatic events like birth, <laughs> like giving birth and postpartum. And, and um, it's just, it's a great, it's, it's an insight that we, and we have to create the, we have to create the archive. So I encourage people to do um, conduct oral history interviews with their families and, and record it or how, however they want to do it. Cause you're going to want to come back to it. And I actually do a similar, it. I do a similar project with my students and they really love it. Um, just kind of keeping with the uh, theme of women here, Dr. Leonard, we have a question for you, which is, can you point to uh, in the U S women's suffrage and um, the pandemic of 1918, 1919? And if there's any connection between those things in that, in that realm? I mean, uh, passes in, what, 1923? Is that right, 1923? <laughs> Dr. Leonard, you're still muted. Uh, am I still there? Am I here? You can hear me. Uh, yeah, I think it was 1920. In fact, it's one of the casualties of the current uh, pandemic that uh, many of the celebrations and the attention that would now be being paid to the uh, 100th anniversary of women's suffrage uh, becoming a, a part of the uh, U.S. Constitution uh, are, are being lost, really, in, the, in all the other things that are going on. And of course, uh, uh, there were many states even before 1920, including Colorado, uh, which uh, allowed for women's suffrage. Uh, Colorado is the uh, first state in the United States that where men go to the polls and actually approve uh, women's suffrage. Wyoming uh, put it into their state constitution in 1890, but they weren't directly voting on the question of women's suffrage in Wyoming. Um, yes, in a in a strange way, uh, in, in a somewhat complex way, uh, the the election of 1918 probably had a uh, uh, an impact on women's suffrage because uh, uh, the uh, control of the Senate. Uh, went to the Republicans, I think, in 1918. And the Republicans had uh, taken um, pretty much a pledge to uh, to push women's suffrage, where the Democrats, uh, because of their uh, Southern connections and their very conservative uh, uh, Southern senators, were dragging their feet on women's suffrage. And so uh, I think uh, the, flu, the flu in a strange way may have helped tilt the election in 1918 to the uh, to the Republicans. And this is something, by the way, that, you know, we really need to study more. It's uh, it, it's amazing how little in, in some respects we know about our history because uh, we just need more historians doing more digging. But uh, there's uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in, in Colorado, I think it was certainly the flu that defeated uh, uh, John Shafroth, who uh, had been a, uh, uh, a, a, a wonderful governor, a wonderful congressman, uh, was then a U.S. senator, and um, didn't have a lot of money. And so he went out and campaigned and gave speeches and shook hands. And he couldn't do that in 1918. And a multimillionaire named Lawrence Phipps, who had a lot of money and uh, had a lot of newspaper advertising, uh, proved that money could talk because uh, he won, had no political experience. Uh, and um, uh, so Shafroth being out and, and Phipps being in may have helped uh, women's suffrage in a certain way, although Shafroth was uh, incredibly in favor of women's suffrage. And uh, so it's a very complex question, uh, but yes, it's, a, it, it's an issue. Excellent. Thank you. That was a, an excellent answer. Uh, Dr. Weiser, I was hoping you might be able to talk a little bit about the plague doctor. Uh, particularly, we have on uh, our pandemics across the ages, we've got the old school plague doctor with the plague beak, and you spoke a little in your talk about the uh, long gown, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the plague doctor and maybe about medical responses uh, to yeah. the plague. Sure. Um, so just to start off with the outfit, right? Uh, the whole idea of the plague doctor's outfit was to stop my asthma. So... 
Um, they had the special robe that was made out of wax with aromatic substances. And then they had the mask. And the idea was to have a very long nose and fill the long nose with fragrant herbs. So that when, so the idea was since er, since my asthmas were supposed to be smelling bad, my asthmas came from like corpses and stagnant lake, lakes and things like that. Since my asthmas smelled bad, um, the idea was that good smelling things would stop them. So often the, the things you hear again and again when it comes to stopping plague is make things smell good. So this could be having the uh, cleaning the streets, which works well. Um, there was a argument in Florence over procession, right? The, the prior wanted a procession. The health officials were all against it. And they had this big, long argument. And eventually, um, one of the compromises was there would be a procession, but very few people would take place. And the entire street would be strew, uh, strewn with fragrant herbs to keep away the um, uh, the plague. Uh, so um, when it came to like the medical theories of the time, right, there was these two, there was my asthma and basically all they could do about my asthma is make things smell good. Um, and to some degree that actually works well because rats and garbage go well together. Um, so if the idea was to make things smell good, that, so that, that was all prevention of the plague. Um, when it came to um, treating the plague, they had no clue. Um, one of the interesting things about doctors at the time was, you know, they were the doctors, the physicians, the guys that went to universities, and they only treated the inside of the body. And anything on the outside of the body were the surgeons who were like, you know, your commoners. Uh, being a surgeon was much, much lower down the social scale which is why the surgeons were the only ones who were sell, sent to the pest houses because no physician was going there. Um, but the surgeons, you know, they, they, they were the barber surgeons. You know, they, cut, they shaved you. They would, you know, bleed you. Um, they would, you know, take case, anything that was on the outside. The plague, of course, it was unclear. Was it inside or outside? Uh, but generally it was the surgeons that tried to do things and they would come up with a bunch of stuff, none of which really worked. They would lance the boo-boos, I don't think that really worked so well. Uh, they would bleed. That would only hurt things. Um, they had all these interesting things. Rue was considered to be good against the plague. And they would have a couple of, thing, of, of specific plague medicines that were based on snake venom. Because the idea was that, you know, um, like cures like. So the plague is venomous and snakes are venomous. But the most bizarre thing I heard was roosters eat like disgusting things. Therefore, what you do is you take a rooster and you like rub it over your body and that should cure the plague. So um, plague doctors had, you know, they, they didn't know, you know, they didn't know about, um, they didn't have any like real medicine at the time, right? They didn't really know what was causing the plague. They managed to come up with some good ideas. Quarantine was a great idea. Um, not so much because it stopped people, but it would stop people with bales of cloth, which is where the fleas were. Um, burning people's clothing if they died of the plague was a great idea. Um, all were on the wrong theory. But when it came to once somebody got a plague, the doctors really didn't couldn't do anything for you. I had a student who did a project once on looking at the herbs that plague doctors from the 15th century onwards used. And the majority of the herbs um, they used did have antibacterial properties, but there was no way that you could use these small amounts of herbs yeah. in any way that was going to do any damage. Uh, I have a question that I think I can probably pose to most everybody here but would be probably most important for Dr. Leonard, Dr. Weiser, and Dr. Makeley. And that's about something that I think is probably at the forefront of many people's minds right now, and that's the economic impacts of the plagues uh, and economic impacts of pandemics and how those seem to affect economics in either short or long term. Uh, so Dr. Leonard, would you like to, to start with that since you are here in the US and talking about US economics? I would, but my thing says unmuting and I can't. No, you're good. No, try try again. I think you're just opposite. 
Try to unmute again, Dr. Leonard. Okay, I just did. So are we okay? Perfect. Yeah, now we're perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, we we did have a sharp uh, economic recession in 1920-21 in the United States. But, and I've been thinking about this a lot, I think it's in, almost impossible, except maybe the economists who uh, understand numbers a lot better than I do, can do it, um, to disentangle the effects of World War I on the uh, economy, uh, because there was a, a great... Uh, just rearrangement of the world economy in 1919, 1920, uh, and uh, really and eventually to the benefit of the United States. And so um, uh, disentangling what was caused by the flu versus what was caused by uh, World War I is a very difficult uh, issue. The other big difference was is that the economy really didn't close in uh, the, for it, in any meaningful way in 1918. Uh, the closing orders in Denver, for example, and many other places in the country, as far as I know, uh, were really uh, minimal. Uh, uh, factories continued to operate. Uh, 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 people you know, traveled on the streetcars. Uh, restaurants in Denver were open. Uh, it, it, it wasn't anything like what we've done in the last uh, last two months. So I, I don't I don't think these are areas where we can make uh, direct comparisons really with 1918-19. Dr. Weiser, would you like to speak to earlier time periods? Sure. Um, so short term, the economic effects were horrible for any place hit with the plague, basically because they would get quarantined. Um, so when Monte Lupo is um, hit with the plague, uh, the, there's a Dominican friar who's in charge of, of, of plague measures there. Um, and he shuts down the city or the village and the people there are about to starve to death because they just can't work. And short term, you really have horrible, horrible, um, effects of the plague. But in terms of like widespread economic effect, it's really hard to figure it out. Uh, because generally speaking, the plague would hit one place and not another place, and it would be in one village and not another village. Uh, yeah, in 1665, London basically shuts down for a year. Um, you know, uh, there's a famous story about um, Samuel Pepys going to the exchange, which is, you know, the center of commerce, and, you know, people aren't there. Um, and, you know, people are burying their gold, and, and there's great fear, um, but the economy at the time was so agriculturally based, um, so much depended on simply people were just growing food and, and to some degree, uh, you know, making clothing that like sort of long term effects weren't as much. And one of the sort of sad reasons why, at least in the plagues in the 1600s, there weren't as many long term effects was that the plague generally killed the poorest people who had the least effect on the economy, if that makes any sense, um, because their houses tended to be closer together and much more crowded. There was one um, old monast set of monasteries in England where somehow they fit 8,000 people in four houses. Yeah, these, these must have been like, you know, giant monasteries, but still 8,000 people in four buildings, no matter how big these buildings are, it was, and that's where the poor people lived. So these people tended not to have, you know, economic lives with massive impact. You know, it's not as if all the weavers died or the master blacksmiths. But, um, you know, short term in, sh in pl certain places, you know, I don't, I don't know enough about it, but the fact that 50,000 of the 75,000 people in Genoa died, that had to do something to the long term, you know, uh, status of Genoa, right? In the 1300s, Genoa is a big deal. In the 1700s, not so much. And I wouldn't be surprised if the plague had a large um, role in that. Well, it does hit Genoa in the 14th century pretty 
heavily too. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in that region through Florence in the 1370s, 1380s, there's massive revolts by yeah. uh, what I tell my students are kind of the upper lower classes, right? right? Uh, the Because the lower lower classes just are trying to eat and live yeah. and it's the people with kind of rising expectations. Right. So Chompy. They're, yeah. yeah, and same thing in France and in England, but that takes a good almost two generations for that those rising expectations to kind of reach the fever pitch. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Dr. Makeley. Dr. Makeley, one of the things I found really interesting in your talk was this idea of the virgin soil uh, and how it kind of relates to epidemics and pandemics. Could you maybe expand a little bit on this idea of the virgin soil epidemic? Sure, thank you. And and I just go back for one second to that last question. Not that I have much to add other than thinking about labor and um, access to labor um, it, during during pandemics. Uh, and and what we find in the Americas very quickly as as European colonizing powers learn that they um, cannot depend on native labor because natives were dying at high rates. Um, due to European diseases, but also due to colonization, dislocation, warfare, and all of the attendant pieces associated with colonization, that they were going to have to find a new labor source if they wanted to do what they thought they wanted to do. And, and so it was at, at least a, a, a part of the emerging trade in human beings that came to be the North American slave trade. Um, so, so there is a labor piece to to the um, economic question with respect to disease. Um, with respect to virgin soil epidemics, that that's, um, thank you for ask, asking that. Um, it's, it's this notion that a very fine scholar put forward, um, Dr. Crosby, who, who passed away, I think last year. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's very compelling. The argument is that smallpox did not have as devastating mortality um, effects in Europe, likely because once a person is um, exposed to smallpox, they gain some immunities. And and with the um, variola virus, which, which causes smallpox, um, an immunity can last for a lifetime instead of just a season. And so that would therefore, um, you know, inoculate um, those who survived in, in Europe. And, and um, as it was you know, passed through generations, um, the, you, you may develop communities um, who were um, hardy and, and resistant to smallpox. The idea that native people had no immunity to that particular disease um, is fairly well understood and it certainly makes sense. And so for a long time, and, and even to this day, there are some scholars, um, there's some really good popular works that reach broad audiences like, um, you know, Guns, Germs and Steel. And the other one, I think, is um, 1493 and, and 1491. Um, and th those books lean pretty heavily on this notion that um, it was an immunological um, inefficiency uh, uh, among Native people that led to the the um, steep decline in population, uh, and and I think research by folks like Elizabeth Fenn uh, at Boulder University of Colorado Boulder and uh, David Jones at, at Harvard have have really done a good job at at suggesting yes there are immunological challenges for Native people uh, with respect to smallpox, um, to be sure. But understanding the disease in its fuller context helps us see that um, many of the challenges associated with being colonized absolutely affect the mortality rate. And, and that's something I might add to my earlier answer as, as well. You know, just the, the, the first question about what's happening today in places like Chin Lee on the Navajo Reservation or, or Pine Ridge or Rosebud, we can't forget that colonization is still among us. It's, it's, you know, we tend to speak of it in the past tense. Um, and, and the reality is for, for many of these folks, you know, the, the Dakota Access Pipeline is a good example. Um, the concern of many of the people who were showing up to support um, the Dakota at, at um, um, the pipeline uh, 
was about fresh drinking water and the concern that there would be a rupture in in the pipe and and that the fresh drinking water would be contaminated. So um, it, it never strays far, you know, um, these conversations about disease never stray far from resources, access to resources, and of course, colonization when we're talking about native people. So um, I hope that that answers it. It does. And I think that, uh, you know, we re when we talk about things like that, we can talk about Flint and, um, you know, their inability or the government's inability to get them fresh water and what that means for people who are living in Flint and how that just wears on you after generation after generation that makes it um, so much more difficult. And there's been a lot of scholars, um, I'm sure Ms. Miller can probably talk a lot more about this, who have really studied about these compounding effects. Um, that last through generations and how those compounding effects really affect our abilities to to resist disease uh, and, you know, any other sorts of things that come through our 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 lives. I had a question come from the audience that I'd kind of like to pose to everybody to see what you think based on on your on your space. Uh, and that is about misinformation and misinformation about diseases and pandemics within the cultures or the communities that you have been looking at. And I'd like to start with Ms. Miller and Ms. Nieto and then kind of move out from there. Um, so Ms. Miller, could you maybe discuss this idea of misinformation in India, um, particularly maybe around HIV and, and how that uh, has changed or not changed since uh, maybe in the last 20 years or so? Yeah. Um, you know, I think very similarly to how we saw a lot of that play out in the United States, um, where it was like, oh, well, this is, you know, just something that affects gay men, um, which we know is not true, um, was also a very like prevalent um, form of thought uh, in India as well, which is part of why they also thought that it wasn't going to like pervade their borders for quite some time. Um, because they were living under this assumption that they that they didn't have gay men who were living in India. They did, and they still do. Um, and so I think, you know, like that's a big part of of the misinformation that we had about HIV in India and elsewhere um, is a big part of it. You know, I think, um, especially when, you know, diseases are first discovered, um, and, and we're seeing this, you know, now too, it's like, well, what are the symptoms? And then what do the symptoms look like? And when do you need to see a doctor? And, and this is how it's spread. And then it kind of like changes and it changes a lot and it changes very quickly. Um, where, you know, like there was a lot of misinformation about like, you know, if you share a water bottle with someone, for example, um, then, you know, that, that transferring of saliva is what's going to like, um, so that's a big, um, a big piece of it. And then, there's a lot of um, like myth out there that uh, if you are a man and you have HIV and you have sex with a virgin, um, then you are curing yourself um, of the disease. Also not true, um, but that, you know, a lot of people um, thought that, still think that. I think that's actually a very common myth, particularly in India. Um, and although I don't necessarily have research to support this, I believe that that may also be part of why, you know, in addition to like some inability um, for women to negotiate uh, safe sex practices and, and facing violence sometimes when they, you know, want to have sex with a condom, um, that we're seeing sex workers have higher rates of HIV because, you know, like if you're, you know, a young, like, like new to the market sex worker, um, then that myth kind of, you know, plays out in that way of like, oh, well, if I, you know, have sex with this woman, she's a virgin, then I'm curing myself. Um, all of which is very, very, very scary and all very wrong. Thanks, Ms. Miller. I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Nieto, could you maybe talk a little bit about this idea of misinformation? I was thinking in particular about how devastating it must have been to have lost your family so quickly um, for your own the family member. And I, I don't know what what would it have looked like for people like to know about the pandemic in that time period in the southeastern part of the United States or, you know, in any places that maybe weren't the major metropolitan centers. Do you know anything about that? Could you talk to that a little? Um, I don't feel like I know enough about it to talk about it. I know that my so my grandmother has told stories about after her mom was taken away, 
sitting in the in their living room on a table was her um her dad dead and he had he was covered in lye which is like white powder is that right and um so she says that she remembers when she was like three or four or whatever it's one of her first memories being her and her cousins being told not to go in there but that's but I don't I don't think that I have I don't think I have much else to add about misinformation, but I did want to kind of piggyback on something that um, uh, Matt said a minute ago, just to sort of in sort of broad terms, if I might, about um, the legacy. I mean, the legacies of colonialism is really what we're talking about. And when we look at contemporary um, experiences of communities of color and we look at um, uh, specifically in terms of labor and the popu- the people that we're seeing who are dying at the meatpacking plants just up the road here are mostly undocumented or, or immigrants otherwise who are considered expendable. We see, I mean, we're, we're asking about economic impact, but clearly the priorities are the economy and not people's lives at this point in the way that decisions are being made. Um, I also wanted to, to touch a little bit on the environmental factors for communities having um, more underlying health conditions, such as uh, the Globeville Swansea neighborhood where the I-70 expansion is happening. And I know that um, they tried to halt the construction during the um, shelter in place orders because the noise and the air pollution and the water pollution um, exacerbates the already existing um, health conditions of asthma due to being living right next to a freeway and some of those factors. And I think that that that's those are, you know, the the fact that the infrastructure on the Navajo Nation is still people are still lacking basic um, access to health, to, to clean water, to wash their hands. And when and, and when we look at the population of peer, people experiencing homelessness in, in the city and the news was like, wash your hands, wash your hands, stay inside, go go home. It, we we can't we can't ignore the fact that there are people who simply cannot do um, what we're being told to do as basic pr- precautions, and I think that we're going to see the fallout of this for a long time um, if we if we don't learn. And I don't feel like we're learning very much if we insist on having our steak and chicken and. <laughs> Not that it, not that it's all about meat, but but I think that there are a lot of um, factors that that we can trace to the to the experiences of colonialism that have forced certain populations into certain um, labor sectors. And then you know when we look at ICE detention facilities, there is it's impossible for anybody to be able to to keep safe at anything resembling social distancing in those kind of facilities. So I think it's important for us to remember that these things are happening right now um, and hopefully we can learn. And and so that's my response to the question that I didn't answer your question, but I answered a different question. That's totally fine. I always (laughs) love listening to you. Uh, um, I always learn so much and and I I always do feel like you you end on a a level of action and hope, which I appreciate a lot. So I, I really think that that's important. And I think that's important with what we're doing here today is kind of bringing this idea of uh, a larger understanding and a longer understanding, not just thinking about things, because it's really easy to just think about what's right in front of you. How am I going to get through my next day? How am I going to get my kid taught? How am I going to get my classes taught? Um, How am I going to make sure that I get my unemployment? How am I going to stay in my house? Like, I think that we're really good at dealing with the thing that is right in front of us, the five steps right in front of us. But sometimes it takes looking 15 or 20 steps behind us to see where the 10 or 15 steps in front of us need to go. And I think that that is one of the important reasons why DeFi does things like this and brings scholars such as you all together to really bring this humanistic idea and lens to this really traumatic experience that we're all going through right now. So I know I, for one, definitely appreciate everything that has been said here today by everyone. I know I've learned quite a bit. I do have a couple of more questions. Um, I want to keep this misinformation going in here, but um, Dr. Davidson actually asked a question specifically for Dr. Leonard, and I want to make sure that we get that before we're out of time today. So her question for Dr. Leonard was, why do you think we learn or hear so much, um, so 
you know, when we're talking about the 1918 flu, like we don't hear about that in the same way that we hear about World War II or we hear about the Great Depression. Um, we hear that maybe from our history textbooks. Like, so when we start talking about this, why do you think we're hearing so little or why did we hear so little about the 1918 flu? And do you think that has any issues with how we're really looking at the pandemic that we're, we're affected by today? Yeah, that's an excellent uh, question. Um, H.L. Mencken, who was a journalist and gadfly in the uh, mid 20th century and early 20th century, uh, said that we put it out of our minds because things that are just totally intolerable, we can't keep in our minds that it was uh, so bad that people wanted to forget it. I'm not positive of that, but I think it's also a, um, a reflection of what, who and what we value in society. I, uh, I'm struck by the number of um, statues there are to politicians and to uh, civil war generals and to uh, any number of uh, people that uh, do uh, important uh, uh, explorers, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of other categories that get a great deal of honor. Um, I don't know of a single statue in uh, Colorado to a public health worker. Uh, I do know of one in uh, Washington, D.C., and that's to Florence Sabin, who is in the uh, National Statuary Hall of Fame in the uh, U.S. Capitol. Uh, she was a great public health advocate and uh, probably saved all innumerable lives in Colorado in the 1940s and early 1950s by helping get things like sewage cleaned up, which, uh, you know, raw uh, in the 1920s and teens, we were dumping our raw sewage into rivers and, and killing kids up in Greeley. The Denver sewage went up there and Kids up there uh, ate the vegetables and got diarrhea and died. And uh, I think we had a seven times the uh, death rate of California in the 1930s in terms of uh, uh, Colorado, in terms of infant mortality in, in, in those areas. So uh, maybe it's, it's what we value uh, that uh, shows why we haven't taken the 1918 uh, epidemic as seriously as, as, as we should have. Um, there's a very good short novel by uh, Catherine Ann Porter uh, called Pale Horse, Pale Rider. That's one of the major literary uh, productions that came out of the um, uh, 1918 flu and has a strong Denver connection because uh, Catherine, uh, uh, she had, she got the flu here in Denver and nearly died of it. Uh, but yes, that's correct. We've generally forgotten it and it's been to our total detriment that we have forgotten it. Thank you so much. I think that's exactly where we're at. Uh, but what we're trying to do here is to fix that just a tiny bit. We have uh, just about six more minutes. So I would like to ask each of our participants here for just a final thought um, that they would like to express about this discussion that we've had about the current pandemic that we're in. Uh, is there any words that you would like to leave for our listeners today or people who will be listening in the future as we've recorded this about this particular thing that we have done here? And I'd like to start with Dr. Weiser. Um, if you would just give us a final thought here. Sure. Um, I'm still thinking about the misinformation question. Uh, so I'll, I'll use my time to talk about that because one of the really interesting things about public health in the 17th century is they realized that for quarantine to work, you needed to trust the government. So they were actually spending a huge amount of resources um, getting correct information out there. So for instance, um, Whenever somebody died in London, their body was inspected by a searcher of the dead to see if it was from the plague. And every week they listed, you know, how many people died in London that week and what was each and every cause. And it was printed. And the idea was that people wouldn't just be like, oh, there's no plague. They would see the bills of mortality. Eventually these get like pirated and other people are, are uh, make, um, make copies of them with this, with the, um, uh, title, May God Have Mercy on Their Souls. And with the list of all the deaths and then prayers and then lots of like images of skeletons and whatnot, uh, 
And eventually these actually become quite useful because not only um, are these bought and they're cheap, they're bought by lots and lots of people so they can keep track, oh, is the play coming? And then um, they used to write in red letters, you know, may God have mercy on your souls on on plague ha on, on houses that were closed with the plague, but they decided to be a lot easier to just take one of these uh, pamphlets and nail it to it. So it saved some time for the plague workers. Um, but what's interesting, I think, for today is that, like, even back in the 17th century, they realized that trust in the government and trust that there actually was a plague was so important. Same thing happens in Italy. In Italy, what was so crucial was that each little city state in Italy had to trust the others that there was a plague. And that's how quarantine works in Italy. And that might be to some degree, you know, it was a small part. That would be a small part as to why, you know, after 1665, there's no more plague in England. After 1720, 1720 is the last real outbreak of plague in Europe, except for one that happens in Moscow 70 years later. So one of the reasons why it may work, and, and only a small part, is that the people trusted the government and they trusted this idea that quarantine can work. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Miller, could you give us some final thoughts? I feel like I have so many, and so I've been trying, you know, while Brian was talking to be like, hey, how do you condense this into something that's palatable? Um, what I, what I hope that people remember from today um, is a lot of the focus on colonization um, that is immensely important um, and tells us so much, not just about where we've been, but where we are and where we're going. Um, and that message cannot continue to get lost um, in our storytelling. Um, and so people don't just bring that up because they want to be like, oh, by the way, like colonization is a thing. It's like, no, we need to work more stringently on, on decolonization um, and, you know, impacts of, of the coronavirus have, have magnified that only further. Um, so I hope that people take that piece away. Um, and, you know, Adriana earlier mentioned um, that we don't really value women's stories. Um, as a woman, I would agree with that. And, um, you know, it really brought me back to, you know, I forgot, uh, Kim and Adriana, the three of us, um, organized feminist first Fridays on campus a long time ago when I was a student. And I, for, I knew that, that I had been a part of it and I forgot who was a part of it with me. Um, and so I feel like that's a very memorable thing just to bring up, um, that we're here, we are together again. Um, but to think about like during this time, how are you listening to the stories of those who are most impacted? because most likely those are the folks who are most most marginalized um, and carry you know some of the highest vulnerabilities and are probably struggling the most. Um, so like while we are all struggling to some degree um, and and there's time and there's space for that and I you know I want to to honor you know that, that we all kind of need to process our own emotions and what's going on in our own lives um, that you also take time to consider and listen to that impact because those voices are gonna determine how we don't do this again and how we don't make the same mistakes again. Um, and so really trying to, to prioritize um, the stories of those folks. Um, so those two things are something I really hope that everyone takes away. Um, and because I would be remiss not to mention it, I'm just gonna do a small plug um, that I teach a course on gender and disaster. Um, and it is being offered um, this summer online in the Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies Department. And there are still seats open. So if you are a student and you are interested in learning more um, about vulnerability and disaster as it relates to identity um, and resilience um, and how communities rebuild, I would love to have you in my class. Please enroll. Thank you so much. Uh, I would just like to say that I am so incredibly proud of you. And I think that you stand as one of the things that makes Metro great. When I look at our alumna and our alumna all across the United States, it's students that have done so much with their degrees from Metro like you that make me continuously proud to be doing what I'm doing. So I'm really excited that you were here today and I really appreciate those final comments. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Makeley, can we hear some final comments from you? Sure, I'll make it brief. I just want to thank my um, colleagues on the panel for this uh, conversation. I want to thank Kim, Dr. Klemek, what a wonderful job moderating. Um, thanks to Dr. Davidson for joining us and kicking off the event. 
thanks to Adam Graves and DeFi and Gabriel uh, and David Sharman and and a number of other folks who made this possible. It's it's a dry run, right? I mean, and we did it live. So congratulations to all of us for for getting through it. Um, hopefully, it's well received. Um, and I would just send my best wishes to anybody listening now or anyone who will be listening in the future and and remind them that um, you know many human communities have gotten through far worse. Um, epidemics and pandemics than than what we're currently experiencing and and that should give us some hope and um history can can help in in that respect and um at least it can help us understand and, and look for those areas of of hope uh with that um i i will effectively um stop talking and uh, again give my thanks to everybody for for today's conversation thank you dr makeley dr leonard a final comment from you I think the thing that we most failed to learn from the uh, 1918 uh, pandemic was uh, the importance of public health. We went back to our old ways of doing things in the 1920s, not everywhere in the country. There was there were some lessons taken, but generally speaking, uh, we failed to learn what we should have learned. If we don't learn that now, uh, we will experience this kind of thing again and again. This, this epidemic will go away. But there'll be another one in four or five years or 10 years, and uh, we can avoid these things to a large degree uh, if we take public health uh, seriously. Uh, not entirely certainly, but, but public health, public health. Why aren't we right now employing huge numbers of unemployed people uh, to become contact tracers, training them, getting them ready to go, because we're going to be going through this for the next uh, year, year and a half. We need those people now. Those people don't have jobs. Those people should be put to work. Why aren't we doing it? Uh, that would be the question I would leave us with. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Leonard. It uh, brings to mind what uh, Brian was saying, Dr. Weiser was saying about the uh, play groups. Uh, Dr. Nieto, would you give us our final, final thought today? Wow, I feel pressure. Okay, so, so every Saturday night I have a Zoom party with my cousins, which I have a lot of. And this past Saturday we talked about, I told them that I was doing this and they're all very, they were all very excited. I don't know if they're watching, but um, a few things that they wanted, they were like, okay, don't forget to talk about this, this, and this. So I wrote some things down because they all work in different fields. One of my cousins is a lawyer, one does farm worker stuff. There's all, they're all over, they have a lot of cousins. But um, a couple of things they wanted me to, 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 um, to bring up in terms of lack of opportunities, right? Educational, health, good access to healthcare, jobs. Um, we see that it's generational. And one of the ways that that cycle has been broken in our own family's lives is, th is by getting an education. Um, most of us have a uh, bachelor's or beyond in my, um, in my family. And there's about 40 first cousins of ours. And, and I think, you know, when I think about my great grandmother's story, you know, she survived the flu coming to her home when she had a baby. And then she went to this in, insane asylum and she survived the flu there. And she went on to live a very long life after that. And so we, we have to remember, like, you know, Dr. Makeley said, there are, there are survivors. Um, and, and I come from, from a long line of them. And so I think it's important to remember that, um, given all of these circumstances that we're currently in, how, how fortunate I am. And I, I, I credit um, my access to an education in large part to that. Um, and my last, my last thought is wear a mask. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thank you. I really appreciate everyone being here today. Thank you to those of you who uh, called in and sent in questions. We really appreciated all of you listening today. And I would just like to, tell everyone who is out there listening today or in the future that Metropolitan State University of Denver, this is actually a pretty typical sort of conversation that those of us on campus have. Uh, we do like to talk to each other and we like to bring up things from the past into the present and through to the future. We are here for the Denver Metro region and the larger Colorado region as well.
As Dr. Nieto mentioned, education is an important and vital way that we can all get through this together. Whether or not you can attend a class or an online class, please know that Metro State is out here for all of us, um, and we are doing our best to bring these things to you. Thanks again to D5. If you have any more questions, uh, please email at dphi at msudenver.edu. That's D-P-H-I at msudenver.edu. You can also check us out online and on our Facebook page. So I'm going to end us off today with saying again, thank you to everyone who came and thank you for the questions and thank you to our fabulous set of panelists.